the mystically divided the world into three different categories of people. And it is simplistic to the point where many of my students have said now, Professor Bob, you know that all people are black and we are you're dead wrong. All people are not alive. People are shaped by environmental influence. They're shaped by weather. They're shaped by the presence of food. They're shaped by the absence of food. They're shaped by attitudes that bring them into, into their society. But now let's deal with this early African for all of the years before he knew that there was anything in the world called a European. Most of our radical activity had to be developed in trying to get this white monkey off of our back. Because we saw one form of radicalism in building a new society without precedent, without precedent, we had to develop another kind of radicalism to deal with the infusion and the coming into our society of people whose words could not be taken, people who did not respect our culture, did not respect our women, did not respect our family structure. So a special kind of radical had to be introduced to deal with this kind of invader. Now, in the United States, <coughs> the radical had to be special again based on the design of the country, the intention of the country. Because this country was designed for free white Protestant males, middle class and up those who agreed with the prevailing political status quo and who owned property. Everybody else was out, including white women. Now, you have the illusion that the state started off democratically when it started off not addressing itself to the major issue the major issue of facing the country at the time was slavery. In this, this uh, event made it a necessity to create another form of radicalism led by Frederick Douglass in the 19th century. My main point is to hook up Malcolm X with his intellectual and revolutionary antecedents. And the main revolutionary antecedents of Malcolm X is the black ministry and the black radical of the 19th century who brought us into the 20th century when radicalism began to be watered down and radicalism began to be compromised. Once again, looking at the radicalism of the United States and looking at how this country preserves itself every time a member of an oppressed group, especially black, showed his people the face of power and what to do about it. He was either murdered, driven into exile, or driven to suicide. Any African person shows his people in this country the true face of power and what to do about it, Guard him 24 hours a day and have someone watching the guard for fear they may not be on. <laughs> All right. But sooner or later, one of three things is going to have to happen to him 
unless you're on God to prevent it, he's going to be assassinated, or he's going to be driven into exile, or he's going to be driven to suicide. Now, have you known this pattern in American history that goes all the way back while we are concerned? And have you began to investigate the mysterious death of David Walker after his appeal, the mysterious death of Booker T. Washington after the last war of the society came into place and began to raise some principal questions about the white, even why he gave him money. And he was gone. And all the other Monroe Trotter supposed to fall off the roof of the house where he lived and where he was born and where he been walking, where he, where he walked around as a child and knew every spot on that roof. Now, who in the hell would fall off the roof they knew that well? <laughs> yeah. Then we understand that Martin Luther King was saved so long as he as he advocated nonviolence. Power. He was on the collision course with those who murder everyone who raises that question and shows his people the true face of power. My point is that Malcolm X not only related to this 19th century radicalism, but he related to the 19th century radicalism in the African world and the radicalism in the Caribbean world, and that of the period when the radicalism of the Caribbean world affected the intellectual wedding between themselves and that and those in the United States in the K-1. Predating Pan-Africanism about a hundred years before anyone began to use the name Pan-Africanism. Going back in history again, looking at the radical factor in our history, I have said that we had three golden ages. Ages of great prosperity. We had two golden ages before we saw the European. We had another one after the rise of Islam disrupted by the Arab slave trade, but we had it in spite of the Arab slave trade that most of the brothers, or perhaps all of the brothers, don't even want to talk about. <laughs> now, how is it, and what kind of people are you to <coughs> have three golden ages? And you might have a fourth one when there are people who've lived and died without having one. What's so special about you? And what I'm trying to point to is what is special about you is your ability to produce radicals who affect social change and who challenge the status quo to the point what they can bring about social change. And this radicalism started early in our history as a people. Now, we began to challenge the norm. We began to make changes and innovations in society that ultimately would change all society. Now, during the dynastic period in Egypt, the first dynasty, impressive, with no more Amina. The second, kind of a holding dynasty, how to keep it dynasty. I mean, they didn't need, they did not move back from our power. The third dynasty, we would produce not only a great radical, but the world's first multi genius who would make radical changes in the society itself. M. Hotel, Bill of the Step Pyramid, Doctor, the world's first physician, 
who lived 2,000 years before the Greeks was called the world's first position. And if you read it, the Greeks was called the first, world's first position. He said, I am a child of the old time. In other words, I am the oldest to the African who is the real father of medicine. And yet the Europeans insist on calling him the father of medicine and take an oath in his name when he, in his writing, told you, told them, I am a child of immortality, the African. Now, my point is that immortality in building the step fear means would set in motion massive building and starting the concept of medicine and beginning the first man to have perform an operation and gathering intellects around him, setting in motion the Egyptian mystery and ultimately the great large and Luxor that the Arabs called Luxor, the Greeks called Thebes, the Africans called Warat. Then he began the concept that would lead ultimately thousands of years later to the concept of higher education. And that men began together and to talk about social change and social preservation. And they began to prepare leadership so well that the nation was never without a supply of thinkers. And that this was done with so much uniqueness he would go into the school to study at the age of seven, seven. He would study 40 years. And most of the time, you would never see a book. And when you come out, he was a physician, an architect, he was author, almost anything you needed to do in order to maintain a nation. And he was a principal thinker, a great teacher, and an oracle, and went out to benefit an entire people. I'm saying that this was a radical step forward that got un underway the radical activity that brought into being a nation called Kemet. Later, to marry, later sites, the Jews called it Miserable, the Greeks called it Egyptus, that was later created into Egypt, that the ancient Africans never called their country Egypt. My main point here is that without any precedence, African radicalism was set in motion and social change came into being. Of course, that was right. Many books <coughs> came into being. Find someone from the Africans are. The different book that was a paper plan out of which came words for his paper, but that's another lecture. Um, but when it was all pulled together into a single work, the best of it, it was called the Book of the Coming Forth of Day and Night, and because the Arab slave grave robbers and robbing African tombs for manuscripts and gold, whatever they could get. Some Arab took this big manuscript out of a tomb in the British who wanted to buy it. After where he got it from, he pointed to the grave these robbers. I've got no dead people over there. They call it the Book of the Dead. <laughs> it had nothing to do with the dead. It had to do with life. Now in this book, you have literally an anthology but coming together many books dealing with 
so she thought, so she came. Out of this book and from these books, in a collective way, came many of the stories that ultimately went into the making of the Bible, a book that would be natively arrived at in human history. People think the Bible has always been here. It's always true. It's, all, it's God's word. If man is God, then you would be right. <laughs> if man put it together. If man changed it many times to suit himself. I'm saying it was a great illustration of truth. It was lessons taken from Africa by the Hebrews. We had some personified to give you the illusion that they were a part of the event involved. Now, we see Africa as the hero, this is something else that the black intellect will not examine. They will not examine with any thoroughness the Hebrew entry for fear of loss of tenure and loss of reputation and loss of limb. <laughs> they will not examine in depth the fakery behind and around the faith called Islam, the most unoriginal of all of the forms of religion, because it came into being so fast. It had to be a few saints familiar, a few familiar, you think it had no original poetry. And no original social social thought. And they don't examine that within a degree because they would have to examine the Arabs who faked it into being. They have to make a clear separation between Islam and Arabism, something the brothers are not willing to do. I'm not saying don't be a Muslim, but I'm saying at what point? Would they turn their eyes away from the Arabs and focus on great black Muslim thinkers who brought the religion into being all radical? You want to relate Malcolm to radicalism within Islam, then you would relate him to a thinker like Abu Barber, who wrote 47 books, each on a separate subject. Two books when he was in exile in Morocco. The last of the great chancellors at the University of St. Colby at Timbuktu. Exile in Morocco, he wrote two books trying to explain his people to those silly backward Arabs, and they never got the point then or not. And yet, you know all of the heroes and you can look the litany of the kings of Europe. And most of the blacks who are Muslim never heard of the black people. Never heard of the black radical warriors in the South. Muhammad Ahmed, the Mahdi. Muhammad Abdullah Hassan, called the Mad Mule of Somaliland. These are black Muslims who fought to free that country from any form of domination. The great black Muslims of West Africa, Second Turei's grandfather, Sumar, and a Muslim who turned to create a separate form of Islam. Amadou Bella, the former. He created an Islam that was basically anti-Arab because he thought they were the corruptors of Islam. This kind of radicalism we have not dealt with, and we have not dealt with the radicalism in the creation of the literature of ancient Egypt and how the Africans arrived at what to do. We have not examined with any thoroughness the works of Sheikh Antetheo when in his writings on the history of taboos he, he showed you that many times 
Africa derived as civil law based on what not, what to do, based on what not to do. Now, if you look now at the negative confession, although you are only interested in the Ten Commandments part of it, which was which Moses took, if he brought them down from the mountain, he had to take them with him because they were in existence two or three thousand years before he was born. <laughs> Born and raised in Africa, born and raised in Africa, a radical thinker for his day. Now, when he was wounded by the Pharaoh and had to put some space between him and the Hebrews and, and his, his country, he took up with the Hebrews. Then, he, in the language of the street, palm off a deal on them. Obey my God, I be your leader. And what did he palm off on them? The concept of monotheism, the concept of the oneness of God as against the multiplicity of God. My point is that he was a radical thinker, but he took his cue from still a radical thinker, more radical than himself. Maybe in religion, the forerunner of radical thinker. Some people said that <coughs> Afnada, who was Canon Ho chapter 4, gave the world monotheism. They're wrong. Some people say that the Hebrews gave the world monotheism. They're still wrong. The Hebrews heard about it, wrote about it, personified it, and got themselves into the picture. But before that entry into Africa, they had never heard about it. What Akhenaten did is to deal with the corrupt ministry of that day, then restricting the travel of people in the country based on the fact that God had limitations and that your God could only protect you in a given space. All he did was to give them back what they already had. The fact that God was omnipotent, God was everywhere, God was in everything, and God goes everywhere. My point is that the beginning of African spirituality was a form of radicalism because the Africans gave the world no religion. The Africans gave the world a universal spirituality. Foreigners, <coughs> hypocrites, took African spirituality misunderstanding it converted into cults and religion and put one against the other and tried to prove that each one of them were the favorites of God. Therefore saying that God is love and God is merciful and God is kind. Then when they said that they were chosen by God, those that they are God's favorite people, they also saying that God has stepchildren. <laughs> and God forbid. If he favored one over the other. My main point is that in this universality of spirituality, God was in everything. God was in all life. God was in all form. If you wanted to pray, you could pray to the wind, because God was in the wind. <clears throat> You can pray to the river because God was in the wall. You can pray to the tree because God was in the tree. But if God made man in his image and the early African understood this, then God was a part of you. And if you turn inward on yourself and examine yourself, self-meditation and self-examination 
talking closer to God. Once they, when the African understood that, he really did not need other people to formalize his spirituality into something called religions and into denominations. It was a radical step forward because no one had ever done that. Okay, my main point is that this kind of radicalism guided Africa through the first and second golden age. And that Akhenaten came close to the end of the first golden age. That the recovery of independence in the thousand years of peace and prosperity brought out another golden age and that golden age did not end until farmers came again. You must remember that Africa existed for thousands of years before any invasion. invasion that the first invasion was 1675 B.C. My main point is that radicalism within Africa itself expelled these invaders and that the third, second golden age began to peter out when the foreigners came again, not understanding African religion, not respecting African custom, first the Assyrian, 666 BC, then the Arabian, 550 BC, called, then called Persian. And they were so brutal that Africans cried out, oh God, if you cannot send me a liberator, send me a conqueror who will show some mercy. Now you can understand why when the little Greek of Alexander, sometime referred to as the great, when he knocked at the door, he didn't have to knock very hard. He was like any other beta, he was the Raper. He was a raider of the granary of Egypt to be his soldier. But he realized one thing, that Africa was the home of the religions of the Greeks. That African radical activities <coughs> had brought into being basic religion. And all of this had happened before the entry of foreigners. And before the foreigners arrived, Africans had already embarked on a radical course. They had created one of the most intelligent systems known to the world. They knew then that if you had a god, you had to have a goddess. For a Western man tries to defy nature, African spirituality was to bring man in harmony with nature. And bringing man in harmony with nature, he would bring man in harmony with his relationship to the woman who gave him birth. And because the African had no fear of women, before Alexander arrived, the African had created a system of lineage where the women rode at the head of her army. Women did not come to power just because they were women. They had to wait their turn like anyone else. But when they became head of state, they led their armies in battle, other than send them in battle. 
may engage in radical activity and social call and equality. Check out the view of the student book, The Culture Unity of Black Africa. It's very good on this point. In part of his book, Africa, the Politics of a Federated State, is also good on this point in his book, Africa Now, Pre-Colonial Black Africa is good on this point. But a group of essays he wrote for the Journal of African Civilization, especially his essay, African Contribution to Civilization, the exact sciences. This point to African radical activity in the sciences before the European could make a bomb of thought. <laughs> What we need to do is to look behind this labor curtain and see what happened to African people during this period of radical social change. And we need to understand the price Africa paid for internal weakness and how it had to deal with this week. The first invader coming in 1675 is the cause and the weakness developed in Africa and Africans had to deal with that tunnel weakness and basically lost some of that independence while making uh, the transition. Again, weakness set in and people began to move into Africa again, taking advantage of that weakness. African people have always been the prize to be captured by other people, principally because we are the world's richest people. We have always had and still have things that other people want, that they can't do without, and don't want to pay for. <laughs> If you understand this, you will understand why the Boers want to hold on to South Africa by any means necessary. Because when they left Europe, they were so ahead, religious malcontent, Calvinists. If you understand how the European means religion, you will understand that the Boers wasn't wanted when they left. And yet, being Calvinists, they belong to a religion that says that they are ordained by God to rule over the lesser breed. Mm -hmm. They declare Africa lesser breed. This brings me to the 19th century and the examination of radicalism in the 19th century and how this 19th century radicalism relates to the antecedents of the radicalism of Malcolm X. Because his spiritual, intellectual, and religious cousin appeared during this period. People who were ultimately engaged in activities similar to him and that Malcolm X is the continuation of 19th century radicalism more than any other. He's also, he, he is a continuation of historical radicalism, but he, more directly, he is a descendant of 19th century radicalism. Now, how then did 19th century radicalism come into being? In the British Isles, British controlled Isles, the British had brought basic white technicians to do work. The Pittsburgh Sugar Mill, 
to do the blacksmithery work. This was a lower class Englishman who had no appreciable status in England because in spite of the need of the craftsman, there was an English aristocratic class that had no great respect for people who had to earn their living with their hands. He was tolerated because he was needed. But in the West Indies, many of these same people, because the white face was at a premium, because he had a social status in the seat of blackness that he never would have had in England, he began to gamble too much, drink too much, and he began now with all the women, mostly black, he began to say yes to temptation, all those temptations. He began to pursue that temptation. <clears throat> if you're going to pursue all of the female temptations you meet on the earth, you might as well be more successful than trying to drink up all the water in the sea. <laughs> it's an impossibility. <laughs> He just push the rest, push up on it. For thinking it's going away because it is impossible to partake of every single one that you need. But well, some of them were just exhausted, some of them were broke, and some of them went back to England. But my main point here is that the African slave began to do that work. And the British had brought furniture from England, saw wood. There were termites in the West Indies who would eat that saw wood for dessert. <laughs> so they had to reproduce this furniture in the hard mahogany that was plentiful in the West Indies at that time, not plentiful at all now. So now you see the emergence of a craft class. In the West Indies, you see the origin of the Caribbean free man. These people, free, free with the question mark of course, began to engage in radical activity agitating against slavery, began to bring into being revolt after revolt until they had established a class a revolutionary that the British could barely deal with. They had brought it into being more successful revolution principally because they could maintain something in the Caribbean island that we could not maintain in the United States. And that was a culture continuity. The drone was not outlawed. And African religions, while not tolerated, were not stringently outlawed. So they could communicate with each other based on the African religion, based on the drum language that went beyond the tonal language. So you had a guarded island of freedom in the Caribbean island. Now in the New England states of the United States, many blacks brought in as slaves because slavery was basically a New England thing. <coughs> This is another lecture we need to, to deal with because most people think oh, it is much more. The South had most of the slaves, and slavery was a southern business. Slavery was not a southern business. The Northern sold the slaves to the North, to the South. And when the Northern won the road, the abolitionists, the South, you, you bunch of hypocrites, you sold me the slave, now you're sending these damn abolitionists around here to take the slave away. <laughs> Now, I don't ever want to be on the side of defending the South when they call the Northern a bunch of hypocrites for selling them a slave and trying to take the same slave away from them and pretending they're so goody goody that now they were hypocrites, they still are hypocrites mm -hmm. on the same issue of the relationship of African Americans to the rest of the country. My main point here is that. Out of this free class came thinkers, 
people who could read, people who could write huge papers, came a class of Caribbean <coughs> who affected the intellectual wedding with a similar class in the United States. This is the origin of the 19th century radicalism in the Caribbean and the 19th century radicalism in the United States. A same form of radicalism appeared in Africa in the almost physical radicalism in the anti-colonial war. And the further radicals didn't appear in Africa in any great number until close to the end of the 19th century. And this was the missionary trained radical who began to appeal to the conscience of the European, forgetting that the question who invade your country, rape your women, take your resources, have no conscience in the first place. So now, dealing with this contradiction in Africa, the colonial war, where they went military to the field, at the end of the 19th century in Africa, in West Africa, they began to produce men like Casey and Hayford, great lawyers like John Manson, Sabah, a school of radicals coming out of Sierra Leone and out of a college called Fort Bay, now the University of Sierra Leone. In Nigeria, a series of radical missionary trade radicals who took them for their word. In East Africa, man, uh, John Chalimwe, uh, who uh, began the radicalism in the afterland. John Chalimwe had gone to Ogolan. He had studied. Christianity. He took up with an African, you know, Black American, and John Lynch. They would go back to Africa, especially Christian Nazareth and our mother. And they would ask the principal question of the missionary. I noticed you were living in big houses and we living in huts. If we all children of the same God, then our living quarters should be equal. Now, if you move into the huts, that's all right. Or we move into the big house. So long as the children of God have the same living quarters. <laughs> if God gave you the right to have certain then I'm assuming that I have that right equal to yours. And not getting what he, the answer they wanted. They began to burn churches all the way into the Congo. Near the end of that century, there appeared among them a strange thing that we have not dealt with, a white black national. <laughs> John Booth. John Booth was from a distant, this is the development of the old women. He told Africans that the white man can't be trusted. <laughs> <laughs> to his everlasting credit, when the Africans asked him could he be trusted, he said no. Chalem <laughs> 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 went and John Lynch brought off what is called the Niasaland uprising. Black radicals fighting against the Germans after the Berlin Conference of 1884 and 5 was set in motion a series of revolutions. The best known, the major major revolt in what they call Tanzania. These Africans who go into battle, dashing themselves with what they call holy water that would deter a bullet. I'm not saying it did deter a bullet, but that's what they said. 
and they would dash themselves water, water, Magi, Magi. This is called the Magi Revolt in Tanzania. In Southeast Africa, now Namibia, the Germans wanted to create a basket of graves by cohabiting with the Herrera did not know that the Herrera woman never cohabits outside of her crew, not even with another actor. See, while I'm talking about looseness and primitive promiscuous in Africa, you quite forget that there were places in Africa where adultery could be punished by death. There are people in Africa who have child marriages, sometimes three children before the actual marriage occurs with the approval of their respective families. There are also groups in Africa where the woman must bring virginity to her wedding bed. When you study the diversity of cultures in Africa, you will find many cultures using many different kinds of methods. But my focal point now is on the radicalness that appeared in Africa during that period. My main point is that at the end of the 19th and early 20th century, in Southern Africa, organization that ultimately would lead to the finding of the first ANC. That the ANC faltered at first, stimulated by the business of Bishop Turner that will come to a little later, an African who became a cop out, John L. Dubé. And then he changed, he became such a cop out being the first African to go to a, a university in Southern Africa, West Waters, right? Still in existence. And to impress his wife, father us, he wrote a scholarly book called The Black Man is His Own Worst Enemy. In order to atone for this later on, when someone showed him what a fool he was, <laughs> he went from village to village laying the foundation for the early ANC. The early ANC was no communist, it was a different organization than have with the infusion of communists who may well be traitors to the ANC and who may well be informers to the South African white government. Yeah. Yeah. You have to walk very carefully when someone else will carry a call. Mm -hmm. <laughs> now, at the end of this century, <coughs> now Atalania brought in to be a large trade union movement. His name, Clement Kadele. This was supreme radicalism to build a movement in Southern Africa for the half a million members. Later on, Isaac Wallace would build a similar movement with a smaller number in Sierra Leone and parts of West Africa. A young radical case they came forth after the exiling of King Trinpe and after the last Ascentic War led by a radical woman gave Ascentic War. The case they came forth would start a demand for the return of the royal family to convert that demand into a demand for independence. When he died in 1931, he sent for his leading student trained to take his place, Joseph B. Dunfall, the sent for J.P. And he said, J.P., the mantle is yours. You do not understand that Africa has a custom of passing the mantle, choosing your successor before you die, and making sure 
and he's going to carry out the program you have designed and make sure that the people approve of the program and approve of him. All of this has been done before the death of Case the Hateful. But Case the Hateful being the right and saint. <laughs> One of the whiskered Irishmen who thought that he was at least Jesus Christ on uh, some day he condescended to be Julius Caesar. <laughs> <laughs> Do not.
19th century. Early part of the 19th century, the massive slave revolt, Gabriel Fossa, 1800. Then Mount 1822. Nat Turner, 1831. David Walker's appeal, and here we got to look at David Walker, because if you read David Walker's appeal and read Malcolm X's message to the grassroots, you will see a similarity. I'm saying, here you have a authentic forerunner of Malcolm West in David Walker and his famous appeal. You have a man setting in motion at a time when there were other blacks, some ministers, some not ministers, telling the Africans to compromise. The Africans in the United States to compromise. They were to lift the arm. He called for an armed struggle with the, with the, the slaveholders. He called for the colored people of the world to rise up against the slaveholders. He had learned one thing that I personally would learn later on. Once you discover the unworthiness of people to rule you, your freedom began with this discovery. Now, have the finest example of a leader to emerge during this half, this first half of the 19th century, Frederick Douglass. Now, Frederick Douglass was not a perfect human being, and too many times we lack the ability to extract from human beings the good that they can do without expecting them to be perfect in every way. He became too much a trap, trapped by the Republican Party, but we talk about this later. The main thing is that a radical class of black did emerge in the appearance of Marvin Delaney, who went out to Nigeria, place for Abakuda, searching for a place for settlement. The argument over the American Colonization Society had occurred. Douglas was correct in pointing out that this society was ruled over by a bunch of whites who just wanted to get rid of blacks, especially the black free man, because Douglas said that maybe the slave would like to trip a little better. Why are you sending these black abolitionists back to Africa, these free blacks back to Africa, instead of sending some slaves, freeing some slaves and sending them back to Africa. It was a good question, but the time was a good question for any time. Because that choice of who to go back told you that the Africa, that the American colonization was a white scheme to get rid of black. It would prove itself more glaringly to be subversive to black interest during the period of Abraham Lincoln, who would just come to that feelingly later on. But I'm saying that the first half of the 19th century, with the massive slave revolt, with the society, with that period, we can trace the radical antecedents of the mouth of that. Using different words, men said different things. When the great minister, in the Highland Garnett, had gone to Jamaica, <coughs> invited by the Jamaican free men, we had heard that conditions in the United States had not changed. He thanked the Jamaican hosts told them, told them, I am returning to the United States. I'm not returning to ask for integration because I do not want it. I am not returning.
attorney to ask for justice because I do not expect it. I am returning to the United States to devote the rest of my life to trying to tear that republic down. Black <laughs> men don't speak that way anymore. We had to wait for a Malcolm X to emerge before someone said, either we be equal in the house, or we don't care if the house stands. And we have to tear the house down to get justice. And this is as a consequence of the fight, because we should pursue our freedom by any means necessary. And when he began to tell animal stories, Malcolm X was going back to the African methodology of teaching. When he was talking about the fox and the tiger, when he lied to Hammer, looked at the spectrum of white oppression and said that there's devil. Well, Elijah Muhammad understood something that we do not still understand. Whosoever is in charge of the hell in my life is my devil. Oh. Mm -hmm. Simple of speech. Now, this is the way many Africans talk. So Malcolm X was not only in keeping with African folklore of teaching, he was in keeping with Caribbean folklore of teaching, he was in keeping with the world folklore of teaching. Because Africa illustrated stories by telling animal stories. Now let me tell you one to illustrate the point. It's a Nigerian story. An Igbo, <coughs> I mean, a story about the Igbo. A snake riding down the road on a horse. And he saw a frog who shook his head and bit it. The Mr. Snake, you don't know how to ride the horse. Let me show you. The snake got down and let him and show him how to ride the horse. And the snake got back on the horse and conceded that the frog could ride better. Then he looked arrogantly down at the frog walking on the ground without any means of transportation and said, to know is one thing, the habits of not. <laughs> <laughs> Don't worry because I said the animals talk. Did you understand what I said the animals say? <laughs> That's important. Because in Africa, you had talking animals. The African assumed that in as much as God had to make the waves in the ocean and the spring, they had some leaves and some other parts of the wood. He had to turn those brown. Way on the other side of the wood, he had to turn those green. Way on the side of the wood. One side of the wood, he had to start the planting season. And another, the rainy season. But maybe in this age, people got to give the animals a voice. But the opposite gave him one. So the opposite walked down the street and sees a father die. And the Mr. Father died, where are you going? <laughs> and the Africans began to tell stories of what the animals said. These were stories of wisdom. And these were il stories illustrating lessons in the period when there were very few books. Now let me tell you another story that's so hacking, so old. If you don't know what one African story, I'll show you my little bit. <laughs> How the spider got his small waist mine. <laughs> he was a chubby little fella. He never came in sight. He heard there's going to be two bankers. 
near each other. So we try to stay on his waist on the right and stay on the left. So one friend, now you wait over here, put a little string in this bank of stock, and you put a string in that bank of stock. And you get the end of the story already because both men will start at the same time. <laughs> both men did exactly what they were told to do and start pulling out the string. And that's how the spider got his small waistline. Now, African housewives tell this story to their children right now. You can eat as much as you want to, but don't be so greedy to eat everything. But well, why couldn't you just say it straight away? Then it wouldn't be the beauty of the poetry. But I would like to illustrate the lesson before they say it, the lesson. They have to spell out the lesson. And sometimes I remember my mother, who I love like a dear to even today, and she would look at me with her hand on her hip and say, mm -hmm. She didn't have to look the second time. Because I knew that hand would come down <clears throat> at a place where it wasn't unwounded, and I would feel something. <laughs> and a warning was all I needed. So she had spoken without opening her mouth. So we began to, to speak in simple. Now, my main point, I wanted to let you know that Malcolm X story about the fox and the wolves and the snakes in the grass comes out of old African tradition and that are certain things that comes down to us through time and space and everything else. Years ago, I accidentally met Ray Charles here in Chicago. I said, Mr. Charles, I believe a secret in your singing, what makes your singing so distinctive is that there is a protracted cry in your voice. These are the wailings of the slave ship coming down through the years, through the bloodstream, down through history. I meant exactly what I said. He said to someone, who is this crazy cat? I wish I could see it. <laughs> 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 he did not understand that our culture was inherited. There are certain things that come down to us through time and history. And sometimes, when you don't have an answer, you want to sound important while you're looking for the answer, and you want your listener to think you know the answer, you said, this is the medical transport down to the bank. <laughs> <laughs> and after that, you got to look for the real answer. <laughs> but this answer holds your audience for a while, it gives you the time to do some more study. Okay. My main point again is to relate Malcolm X and his story and his teaching method mm. not only to ancient Africa but to the teachings of the deity known as Jesus Christ. Now how can I do this? Easy. Because very often, Malcolm X taught based on what was in front of him right then. He taught a lesson based on current reality. Now, to understand a Malcolm X, you have to understand this. I have said in a previous phrase that in another time and place, <clears throat> and on the other circumstances, a Malcolm X could have been a king and a good one. He could have made a nation and he could have destroyed a nation. 
And he was the finest example of leadership to emerge from the working class in black America in this century. Mm -hmm. And he was clearer on more issues and came directly to the heart of more issues than any man we have produced in this century. He did not have the time to intellectualize around this issue. That he came from the lower depth out of the mire and he learned from every step of the way things that he would apply later on. <clears throat> what we need to look at is the circumstances in the United States that went into the making of his mind and the making of his action and his ability to not compromise in a given situation once he had arrived at an explanation. Let's look at the death of his father, these early years, the mangled body of his father, thrown on the porch literally by members of the northern Ku Klux Klan, his mother going slowly insane, the children being taken away, his early years in school when teachers discouraged him from aspiring to anything higher than that of a carpenter, planning suspicion in his mind about what he could be. Then, his gradual growth, never getting out of his mind the fact that he grew up in a society that was programming him to be a servant of the society, other to be a beneficiary of that society. Coming to live in Boston and coming to Harlem, he would become both the servant and the user of that society. He would become a parent. He would become a user of dope and a seller of dope. He would become a waiter, a waiter and a hustler. He would become a petty gangster and big red. Men would, again, one would, would fear him. He would go back to Boston where he would get arrested. And now we see after a while, his making in the isolation of a jail is being introduced to Islam by his relatives, brothers, his reading of the literature of Islam, his exercising discipline on himself by refusing to eat pork, his slow learning that became rapid learning, his ability to try to train himself with words, taking a dictionary starting for A, which tells you a whole lot about this conception of education in the United States, his fascination for the for Elijah Muhammad before he had even seen him. His final emergence from jail as a Muslim, heading Mars in Detroit, becoming active in Chicago, married, coming to New York. And I would meet him in 19... 58 after my return from Africa, I was head of an exposition called the, the African Heritage Studies, a 
expedition, the first expedition of its nature in New York, and he was one of the exhibitors. And he came in because his group had stalls in the exposition. He would come in and see how they're doing, and he would come in and talk to different people. And he had said nothing to me other than hi and to acknowledge the fact that I had done a good job at making sure that his people had good space where they were noticed by the different people attending. He let it go at that until a fellow friend of mine asked his girlfriend to meet him, meet him there, and she was quiet. And she was standing talking to me, and he waited until she walked away and came over to me and said, Who's she? That's your woman? That right. No sudden. That's your woman. <laughs> She belonged to us. She belonged to a friend of mine. That's the way they're telling me, you know, come by and pay up. Well, I can tell you. I've been down that street. You need to a dead end. Do you walk away? That was the beginning of our relationship. I have not talked extensively about my direct relationship to Malcolm X because after his death so many phonies emerged as his friends I decided I wasn't going to get on this bandwagon. There was something genuine about the relationship between Malcolm X and myself. Malcolm X had a shallow cabinet of non muslim who gave him advice. He had a political man he would turn to when he had to make a political lecture. He would make a lecture on education. He had someone else to turn to, only that was an African woman. All these people still alive now. None of them came out of the closet and say, I was great on my, my words. But all of them respected him enough to have served him and kept quiet about it. Because there was nobody was disagreeing between them and the two of them. I was the person on this. Get to the world over. So he would call me, give me a folder on this, and he would send a brother around to pick it up. And one time, he had to debate two college professors on the Congo situation. He said he didn't get the folder until 7 o'clock. It was 9 o'clock when he started to read it. It was 11 o'clock when he went on the radio to debate for two hours on the subject. He said the first, the main thing he read was the little pamphlet by Mark Twain, King Leopold's soliloquy. And a few of the newspaper clippings about wholesale money. No man could do more with good information than Malcolm X and use it correctly. <laughs> he could box you into a corner and you wouldn't be able to get out. And the one thing he learned in a conversation with professor, always take the conversation into the area you have studied. And when they get into an area that you have not studied, go slow until you can pull the conversation back <laughs> into the area that you have studied. <laughs> he took that combo situation and beat those people across the head for two solid hours, one being killer cloud, and made them look like children. After this, he had a, I had a new respect for this man's mind. Finally, I got a job as a pilot to NBC program they did called the Harlem Temper. Still one of the best early TV programs on Harlem. Documentary. And 
Because I knew Malcolm X, I would go to the mosque, ask him to participate in the uh, document, and he did. Not only participated in the document, he got one of Elijah Mohammed's sons that we don't hear about, but for our ball, to also participate. He let us film inside the mosque. He filmed a demonstration outside, in the street, on the outside, and he gave us priority for filming. I am an advisor to the family, and as a technical advisor, I have to tell the cameraman what shots are the most pregnant for visuals. I was kind of pointing to the cameraman, take that, take that. And the black women were standing by and said, oh, at last, they give them one of us a job in high time. And he, he, he was so nice to tell them white folks like this thing. I became the cutest thing to them. <laughs> it is you mad. <laughs> The fourth thing that Malcolm had opened that door for me, and we would remain friends. And the one thing Malcolm X was yield, did not yield on, he'd be very proud of me right now. But then I was a fourth eater. He said he would meet me sometime in the back of a restaurant and all for 22. And he would have nothing but coffee because he's very careful about eating away from home. He would hit me on the back with that beautiful box and he'd say, John, I'm going to give you a man tonight. Why not? A hundred now. He said, if you leave the swine alone, you get a hundred. <laughs> <laughs> Here you come with your full eating cell. <laughs> when you got four feet tonight, how would you ask him some notes and some historical things he wanted to know about or had not known? And he would read them and he'd integrate them into his talks later on. And Malcolm was a learning human being. It was a beautiful thing at that time. So I knew him through the last phase of his activity in New York, in the march. And when the tide began to rise against him, during the march on Washington, again I had a temporary job, a new wife, baby on the way, so that's why I need money. And I had this relationship. He, Malcolm X, a lot of people don't even know this, started a newspaper called Mr. Muhammad Speaks in New York City. This is before they brought it to Chicago. Elijah Muhammad contributed to the paper. But the main feature dealt with other aspects of it. He asked me to write an article on ancient Nigeria to the present. I've done one part of the article, but dealing with the main part he wanted to know about, the House of Fulani Wall, because this dealt with conflict between two Muslim groups in Nigeria. They are still in Nigeria, they are still in conflict. The house is in the I never got to the other part of it because new jobs, scramble, and one thing uh, after the other. And finally I got a job as an advisor who was going to film the march on Washington. Malcolm X had petitioned Elijah Muhammad for permission to lead his unit in this march. The mission was not given. 
Now, Malcolm X was outgrowing the stage of Islam. He had gone beyond the narrow program of the nation. He was champion at the bed, wanted action over and beyond what the nation could punish him. Elijah Muhammad was often getting ill going to live in Arizona. Then in partial isolation. The fruit of Islam built by Malcolm had former hustlers, former jailbirds, former murderers, former con men, and opportunists who never lost their trade so in the movement. They began to suspect that if Elijah Muhammad died, Malcolm X would be the successor. And Malcolm X knew them well enough, having trained them, he knew which one would even turn on him. They began to spread rumors within the group, within the Muslim movement, about Malcolm. Then finally came this speech, and Malcolm was answering a question, not, not even a part of his speech. After the death of Kennedy, he said something about chickens coming home to roost. The rumors about Malcolm had already reached Elijah. Elijah suspended Malcolm for 30 days. Malcolm X knowledge of the secretary that Elijah Muhammad allegedly had gone with and had children by shocked Malcolm to the point where Malcolm X loved the old man to the extent that he wanted to even find a hope in scripture that would justify what his father had done. To Malcolm X, Elijah Muhammad was the lost father that Malcolm X never had. The father that left him early in his life, he had found that father in him, in Elijah Muhammad, and he had addressed himself to that image, and he was loyal to that image. Now he's got a dilemma. He is partially out of the movement. He has strong following who are non modular He has strong support that is non modular He has gone beyond the nation. He has been Elijah Muhammad's spokesman in the nation. And Malcolm X, more than any other person, made that movement publicly. And made it possible for that movement to sustain itself by an answer. He was an honest man instead of hustling and getting some houses on the movement that was enough money for him to have that. He assumed that if anything happened to him, the nation would take care of him. He had miscalculated the fruit of Islam. Many of them his enemies. He had also miscalculated the fact that there were members in the movement who were agents of the FBI. And it is suspect that John Ali, the National Secretary, was the main agent. The money handler. Now, a man in, the, in Elijah Muhammad's group that like John Ali had the boss of his wife and given him seventy-five thousand dollars, quite a bit of money for a black man to have in a movement that put a people movement. This caused some people to have suspicion. Others did not. Sylvester Leach wrote articles inferring it, but could not say it directly because he couldn't prove it. Now, the next did not pay a great deal of attention to the rumors about 
John Ali. During the period of, ex of uh, suspension, the month was almost stopped and no one had let Malcolm X know whether he would be able to come yes, yes, into yes. the movement, uh, back into the movement or not. Malcolm X had sent men in letters to Elijah Muhammad. And finally he got no answers, he began to take messages. These messages were all, absolutely all interesting. In, 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 he got a man never got in his effort. So therefore, Malcolm X, please, Malcolm X, attempt to compromise. Malcolm X telling Elijah Muhammad, we have something here that is good for a people. We should not let it be disruptive. He offered to go back into the nation and just as a preacher and to give up his other public activity, which was a great compromise indeed, which would have uh, made Malcolm X a century of servant to the Muslims, but not a servant to the vast number of people who respected him who were non Muslims. It was a big compromise because it's a compromise he didn't care to make that would cut him off from a whole lot of people. Malcolm X had been a great teacher. He had extended beyond this movement. Finally, when it became clear that he would not be invited, he came out and formed the Muslim Mosque Incorporation in the organization for Afro-American Union. The organization and finally, the two organizations had to set a series of meetings at a restaurant in Harlem called the Flash Inn. It's an expensive restaurant, but they are not open on Saturday until the lunch hour, so we could get the space free of charge, thanks to Percy Sutton, on Saturday morning. But this is what we met. It was really here that the decision was made to call the organization, the, uh, to title the organization after the organization of Af African Union. <coughs> he literally assigned me to the task of getting the constitution for the organization of African Unity. And the meeting to develop the constitution for the organization of Afro-American unity took place in my living room then in Leonard's Terrace. I would never, by my free will, move into a place like Leonard's Terrace. I would do something better with my money, considering the high rents that they charge. I would want a larger piece of real estate for that kind of money. My main point is, that, which is of no great significance, is that no what the hell you do it and let them check with a doorman and all that stuff. You have to work with that. I'm married in two of these apartments. <laughs> 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 but the girl that I'm married lives in another step. <laughs> so I gave up my large one room studio and one of this. 36th Street. It was a well furnished one room with all the basic necessities. And I called it the studio because writers and intellects live in studios. <laughs> <laughs> all everybody came there. I was able to rehearse play. Will Hammond plays the part on Bill Cosby show. Bella Bondi looking for the folklore of song. Reverend Bridgie, who later became a leading songwriter, and my daughter's godfather. 
different people looking for background because the place was literally a library of information and myself, you paper clippings and different information I've spoken on, people thought you had information on it. So people would come, you know, by people people of of caliber would come by. Diane Sands, long before she appeared in Raisin in the Sun. Lorraine Hansberry looking for information for Paul Robinson's paper, Freedom. Mm -hmm. Hal Cruz is dull self looking for trouble to get into. The Harlem writers deal on the John Killing would meet there occasionally. And sometimes in this big room I would give a party, 27 people or more, go for all of them. And occasionally, on the very occasion, a Malcolm X, instead of sending the information, would come to pick it up himself, but never alone. He rarely ever did anything alone. And when he was interviewed, he always made a point of having someone else witness the interview. He's a very conscious human being, and except for coffee, and one single time after he left the movement and was busy one day, they stopped down to pick up a steak and asked someone to fix it. He stood right in the kitchen and watched every move I had made until the steak was finished. And he, and he ate the steak. That's the only time he ate outside of the restaurant. He rarely ever ate at other people's homes. He never ate anything in mind, but occasionally I could serve him some coffee. Okay, my main point is that in the organization of African state, the organization of Afro-American unity, every time we struck a good core in the wording of the Constitution, Malcolm X was like a juvenile child. This man, with all that has been written about him, had a beautiful shyness about him, just like an obedient child in the presence of an admiring family. And yet, this man was clearer on more issues in relationship to the reality of the African world than any other person. Now, I was a nation of Islam, he would go to Africa. He would make two main trips. You have to make sure you understand what happened. In Egypt, when he was attempted to be poisoned, he knew then, and this was after the burning of his house, he knew then that the Muslim movement and the United States could not reach this far. He knew that the FBI or the agents were out to get him. He knew the murder style of the truth of Islam. He knew that this was not their murder style. Malcolm X had unfortunately not studied division within the Muslim movement of the Arabs. One group of Arabs, thoroughly corrupt and debased as a mangy dog, uses Islam commercially. Build stores all over the world, connect with other Muslims. Some of them live in Switzerland, near that bank account. <laughs> Two people bidding for him and he don't know either one. Unfortunately, he leaned in the wrong direction. 
and he leaned toward those who were also capable of being manipulated by the CIA the FBI. <laughs> Malcolm X knew the long arm of the intelligence community that extends to French intelligence, British intelligence, and the intelligence system of the colonial world. And that he is facing a larger force than the field of Islam. On his way back, he wanted to stop in Paris. He was prevented from in Paris. He wanted to stop in London, and he was prevented from entering London. On the hard, he had seen black Muslims, brown Muslims, white Muslims, all worshiping in that. This was and please hear me well, an observation. Too many people interpret this observation as meaning this is a major change in the life of Malcolm X. He is now an integrationalist. He was never an integrationalist, nor did he lean in that direction for one moment. Because he gave a series of lectures at the Socialist Forum, the assumption with the Socialists, mostly the Trotskyite Socialists, <laughs> that Malcolm X was leaning in that direction. Now with the doors that were open to him when he was part of the nation closed, he had to turn to other forums. He had to turn to other platforms. So the Socialist Forum, the militant forum that, that you think of the militant, in the series of forums, because Malcolm X accepted that invitation more than some others because there was no comparable space. <coughs> available to him, and he had a new kind of audience. His black audience was following downtown anyway, but he spoke downtown or uptown. He had basically a black audience. Now he's got a sprinkling of whites. He is calling on the whites <laughs> to teach other whites whites who wanted to help, wanted to integrate. He's calling on them to inform other whites about our plight, but then to get directly into it. You straighten out your brother, and that will be a great help to us. <laughs> other than joining us. They didn't get the point then. They don't get it now. <laughs> began to put the material together on Malcolm X. He's not going to use it extensively until Malcolm X is dead. White people are strategic planners. Sometimes, because we are so unsuspecting, we fall into that trap without knowing we are in that trap. Malcolm X will hold several press conferences about the new thing with Elijah Muhammad. In the meantime, Malcolm X continued to try to get through to Elijah Muhammad. He continued to try to strike a compromise even after he had wanted to expose Elijah Muhammad's indiscretion with the young girl. He still thought the place that his role would be best served as part of the nation. He thought some kind of arrangement could be made. All right. He would go to Apple this second time. He would go to the organization of Apple America, African Unity. He would go 
and sent in as observers and he would get eight African nations to sign an agreement that they would now bring the problem of black America to the forefront of the world community as a human rights issue other than a civil rights issue. Now you see Malcolm X writing his own epitaph. At this point, we should have put government around him for protection 24 hours a day, and we should change the gunman often enough so if anyone gets an idea, he could be worse by another one. And if anyone steps out of line to try to harm him, he could be cut down by another one. We didn't have that foresight then. He continued to conduct the forums at the Audubon Theater, Old Ballroom. And then now one tear down, but that's still another story. He would invite Muhammad Babu, then a successful revolutionist who had brought some similar to unity between the island of Zanzibar in Tanzania had some success in this revolution. Babu was part Arab and part of that mixture of Arab and African that came together when he was more African than Arab and only showed a small amount of the Arab infusion. He would invite different people different to speak at different times. Mm -hmm. Some of the brothers would definitely warm up the audience and there will be basic entertainment before the speaking. Other Davis who have been supportive of him, other people have been supportive of him, consistently tried to persuade him to stop people being such as they entered the hall. <coughs> and they also persuaded him this had something to do with his image. Finally, and people think that the suspension of the search had happened several weeks before his death. The first week he suspended this touch. There were no men standing in front of the stage, some with rifles. There was no one standing on the stage looking out into the audience just in case something happened. There were no people at back, at back, and there was no search. Malcolm X had been fatalistic about his own life. This could have been a revolutionary error that we might have to correct. When a revolutionist becomes fearful of his life, the people that he is a revolutionist about, the cause that he is a revolutionist about, should throw enough protection around him to take away his fear. They should say, if they want to kill you, they got to come through us first. And once they come through this wall of flesh, there's another one they got to come through. And the protectors of Malcolm X should let them know that if you come to take a life, you bring a life with you because we intend to take some too. well known that could have been a justification for the removal of the sub. Another unfortunate thing is that Earl Grant, who was one of Malcolm's photographers and bodyguards and personal friends, was also a sharpshooter. And had Earl Grant been on stage with his rifle, what 
watching with those eager eyes he had when that man stood up. He would have been on his way to his grave. But blood would have cut him down. And we would only take one shot. This man was an expert rifle in the army. Trained killer. Mild as a lamb if you leave him alone. But if you're rough with him, you've got an enemy. Not going to be easy to deal with. Okay, he's not on the stage. Nobody's watching in the back. The policeman, formerly at the station, at the door, or outside of the door, absent. It's hard, it may be hard for you to understand that the first opening, there have been many attempts on but the first opening this killer's got to use. That Malcolm X was killed this very first week the search was stopped. He was not killed weeks later. He was killed that very first week. A commotion started in the back. Malcolm X came out telling the brothers to cool it, cool it. This was to take out while Malcolm X focus at the back of the auditorium. Two brothers started a commotion in front and five. Now, that's too much body action not to have been stopped. That body action could have easily been stopped had the guards been in front of the stage and two men on the stage, one being Earl Grant, the expert writer. Malcolm X came into the goodness and the persuasion of a group of people, all non muslim and I do not believe that any of them knew the consequence of what was going to happen and that any of them were in the pain of uh, any agent of assault. They were people who meant well and people who were good friends of Malcolm. <laughs> But who thought that Malcolm's image literally called for him to withdraw all of this protection and let the brothers in because we had loved him enough that no one who couldn't there would harm him. They had underestimated the black killer. They had underestimated blacks in the pay of whites. They underestimated the fact that Malcolm had done the unforgivable. He had shown his people the true face of power and what to do about it. This was after the bombing at Birmingham when Martin Luther King made that terrible statement, if blood must flow, let it be our blood and not the blood of our white brother. Direct forward. That was obscene, even above God. Yeah. Yeah. Martin would never been wrong, more wrong than that. That disenchantment and spent some of the students had grown tired of the concept of violence and non-violence. The march at Selma, when there was a government agreement that would not be disrupted, they, they ran those horses and beat the kids with bitter sticks. After Martin symbolically had gone on the march and returned to Atlanta, that was a violation of an agreement that the local sheriffs had made with the American government. We knew then, while appealing to the conscience of people, we were appealing to people that had no conscience. In the meantime, they had killed two white people, a woman and a man, who they were no respect of their own kith and kin. Everybody should have been on guard. Malcolm X was fatalistic about this whole thing. He expected it early 
and he was saved through his verbal language and through his body language. Go ahead and get it over with. He suspected that he was in the trap. He couldn't get out of it. This could have been an ideological mistake. It was surely a revolutionary mistake. There should have been people around Malcolm X who could have countermanded his orders and still get along with it. I don't mean the disrespect of him in any way. I say, I'm sorry now, but you need protection and you are going to get it. And did it over his protest. But they did. And he was killed. He was killed, and a whole lot of people came out of the woodwork saying they were Malcolm's friends. It become the end thing to tell about your life with Malcolm, your conversation with Malcolm. So therefore, I kept quiet. Because I did not want to be associated with these bummies. I kept quiet about the long conversations in the back of 22 restaurants. I kept quiet about the long conversations before and after the meeting it flashed in. I kept quiet about the assignment he had personally given to me to look up things and give them occasionally. They were things not specifically to history, but related to the black condition where he said, John, give me a reading on this matter. And I would look up the material and read it over as if this is my interpretation. He was not bound to accept my interpretation, but as if my reading of the matter tells me this. He would use the part he wanted to use, and I told him, any time you want to discard anything I give you, you don't have to call and get permission. You just go ahead and do it. Use what you think is best, discard the rest, or keep it. We do not have a kind of relationship when I'm so sensitive that you must make use of everything I give you. So it continues. Betty would tell me later on the people called Malcolm all through the day. She didn't know who some of them were, but he had left the word to us that if John called, let me know. And he always returned the call. Sometimes at some gosh darn hour in the night when I think even God had gone to bed. <laughs> <laughs> and he would call sometimes at 2 o'clock he said good noon he was out <laughs> and he would start kidding me you still eat full you still hang out that's why <laughs> and after we have my little joke about my, my bad diet he gets busy you know, had I paid attention to him, yeah. had I stopped sitting down to meal and sprinkling salt automatically before tasting the food, yeah. <laughs> had I went on a no, on a diet of fish and fowl and left pork alone, which causes mucus, which causes pressure in the eyes. Yeah. Though glaucoma is hereditary, it could have been caught early enough to have been cured. Yes. Yes. So he was right after all. Yes, he was. <laughs> Too late for me to realize it, but I only got 5% of my vision left. But the important thing is that Malcolm X brought to the scene of protest, a directness that we had never known before. Too much has been made over the alleged difference between Martin Luther King and Malcolm X. 
both men were heading in the same direction using different methods. King was using indirect methods, Malcolm was using direct methods. Malcolm was about something King was not about. Malcolm X began to have a global view of what of the African world. King was never a pan-Africanist or a black nationalist in any way. King hung into the concept of the judo Christian ethic, not knowing that it was the judo Christian ethic that got us into the same place and it kept us in bondage. to have gone down that road. Although the ultimate goal of both men was for the citizenship and the basic dignity and the manhood and the womanhood of his people. White people create conflicts where there are no conflicts. And we are mishearing our greatest messengers because white people told us that that a conflict existed between them. So therefore, people began to criticize Du Bois and had never read one word of Du Bois. People began to criticize Marcus Garvey and had not even read one word of Marcus Garvey. People began to criticize Booker T. Washington's educational program and had not read any of the two books written or pulled together by Du Bois and Washington on education and did not understand these two men were not enemies. They were two men who grew up in different environments and had different points of views about the same things based on that environmental growth and that class growth. Du Bois from New England, Washington the former slave, from the South, at a very. These two men were not expected to look at the world the same way. And while they had a difference of opinion, they did not have any conflict. So Malcolm X would emerge in the 20th century, the intellectual antecedent of a Bishop Turner, coming in the 19th, early in the 20th century, of Edmund Wilkmont Blyden who went out to Liberia. Tradition is part of this history. All right. I have simplistically divided the world into three different categories of people and it is simplistic to the point where many of my students have said now, Professor Fowler, you know that all people are lagging. We have 